what's the difference between uh, where's the the place of disagreement um, between phrase structure grammar and dependency grammar? They're they're very close. So phrase structure grammar and dependency grammar aren't that aren't that far apart. I I, I like dependency grammar because it's more perspicuous, it's more transparent about representing the connections between the words. It's just a little harder to see in phrase structure grammar. You know, the, the place where Chomsky sort of devolved or went off from, from, from this is he also thought there was um, something called movement, okay? And so, so, and that's where we disagree, okay? That's the place where I would say we disagree. And, and, and I mean, we'll, maybe we'll get into that later, but the yes. idea is if you want to, do you want me to explain that now? Or I would I, love, can you oh, explain okay. movement? Movement, okay, so You're Chomsky saying so was, many interesting things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's the, movement is, Chomsky basically sees English, and he says, okay, I, I said, um, you know, so, so we had that sent, sentence earlier, like, it was like two dogs entered the room. Let's change it a little bit, say, two dogs will enter the room. And he notices that, hey, English, if I want to make a question, a, a, a yes-no question from that same sentence, I, I say, instead of two dogs will enter the room, I say, will two dogs enter the room? Okay, there's a different way to, in, of, to say the same idea, and it's like, well, the auxiliary verb, that will thing, <laughs> it's at the front as opposed to in the middle, okay? And so, and he looked, you know, if you look at English, you see that that's true for all those modal verbs and for other kinds of auxiliary verbs in English. You always do that. You always put an auxiliary verb at the front, and and what he when he saw that so you know if I say um, I can win this bet can I win this bet right so I move a can to the front I, so actually that's a theory I, I just gave you a theory there I he he talks about it as movement that word in the decl thinks the declarative is the root is is the sort of default way to think about the sentence and you move the auxiliary verb to the front that's a movement theory okay so, and he he just thought that was just so obvious that it must be true, that, that, that there's nothing more to say about that, that this is how auxiliary verbs work in English. There's a movement rule such that you're move like to get from the declarative to the interrogative, you're moving the auxiliary to the front. And it's a little more complicated as soon as you go to simple, simple present and simple past, because, you know, if I say, you know, John slept, you have to say, did John sleep? Not slept John, right? And so it's, mm -hmm. you, you have to somehow get an auxiliary verb, and I guess underlyingly, it's like slept is, it's a little more complicated than that, but his, that's his idea, there's a movement, okay? And, and, and so a different way to think about that, that isn't, I mean, the, then, then he ended up showing later. <laughs> so he proposed this theory of grammar, which has movement. And there's other places where he thought there's movement, not just auxiliary verbs, but things like the passive in English and things like um, a, a questions, WH questions, a bunch of places where he thought there's also movement going on. And in and, and each, each one of those, he thinks there's words, well, phrases and words are moving around from one structure to another, which he called deep structure to surface structure. I mean, there's like two different structures in his, in his theory, okay? Um, there's a different way to think about this, um, which is there's no movement at all. There's a, a lexical copying rule such that the word will or the word can, these, these auxiliary verbs, they just have two forms. And, and, and one of them is the declarative and one of them is the interrogative. And you basically have the declarative one and, oh, I form the interrogative or I can form one from the other, it doesn't matter which direction you go. And, and I just have a new entry, which has the same meaning, which has a slightly different argument structure. Argument structure is just a fancy word for the ordering of the words. And so if I say, you know, it, it, it was um, the, the dog's two dogs can or will enter the room, the, the, there's two forms of will. One is will declarative, and, and then, okay, I've got my subject to the left, it comes before me, and the verb comes after me in that one. And then the will interrogative, it's like, oh, I go first. Interrogative, will is first, and then I have the subject immediately after, and then the verb after that. And so you just, you can just generate from one of those words, another word with a slightly different argument structure with different ordering. And these are just lexical copies. They and they're just, exactly. they're, they're not necessarily moving from one to There's another. There's no movement. There's a romantic notion that you have like one main way to use a word and then you could move it around. Right, right, right. Which is essentially what movement is yeah, implying. Yeah, but that's that's the lexical copying is similar. So, that yeah. you, so, so then, then we, we do it. lexical copying for that same idea that maybe the declarative is the source and then we can copy it. And so an advantage uh, for, well, there's multiple advantages of the lexical copying story. It's not my story. This is like um, uh, Ivan Sog, linguists, a bunch of linguists have been proposing these stories as well, you know, in tandem with the movement story. Okay. You know, he's, a, he's, Ivan Sog died a while ago, but he was a, one of the proponents of the 
non-movement of the lexical copying story. And so that is that um, a, a great advantage is, well, Chomsky fa really famously in 1971 showed that the movement story leads to learnability problems. It leads, it leads to problems for, for how language is learned. It's really, really hard to figure out what the underlying structure of a language is if you have both phrase structure and movement. It's like really hard to figure out what came from what. There's like a lot of possibilities there. If you don't have that problem, learning the learning problem gets a lot easier. Just say there's lexical copies. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. When I we think, say the learning problem, do you mean like humans learning a new language? Yeah, just learning English. So baby is lying around <laughs> listening to the crib, listening to me yeah. talk. Yeah. And it, you know, how are they learning English? Yeah. Or or you know, maybe it's a two-year-old who's learning, you know, interrogatives and stuff, or one, you know, they you know, how are they doing that? Are they doing it from like are they figuring out or like you no? Know, so Chomsky said it's impossible to figure it out, actually. He said it's actually impossible, not mm -hmm. not hard. But impossible, mm -hmm. and therefore that's what that that's where universal grammar comes from. Is that it has to be built in, and so what they're learning is uh, that there, there's some built-in movement is built in in his story mm -hmm. is absolutely part of your language module, and uh, and then you are you're just setting parameters. You're you're set depending on English is just sort of a variant of the universal grammar, and you're figuring out oh which orders do, does English do these things. That's the the non movement story doesn't have this. It's like much more bottom up. Uh, you're you're learning rules. You're learning rules one by one, and oh there's th this this word is connected to that word. A, a great advantage. Another advantage it's learnable. Another advantage of it is that it predicts. That not all auxiliaries might move. Like it, it might depend on the word, depending on whether you mm -hmm. and 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 that turns out to be true. <laughs> so there's words that um, that don't really work as auxiliary. You know, they work in declarative and not in in interrogative. So I can say, um, I'll give you the opposite first. If so, I can say, "Aren't I invited to the party?" Okay, and, and, and that's an that's an interrogative form. But it's not from I aren't invited to the party. There is no I aren't, right? So that's that's interrogative only. And and then we also have forms like um ought. Uh I I ought to do this. <laughs> and and I guess some British old British people can ought say I. Uh, exactly. It doesn't sound right, does it? For me, yeah. it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even think ought is great, but I mean I totally recognize I ought to do it. It's not too bad, actually. I can say I ought to do this. I, that ought sounds pretty I. good. Yeah. If I'm trying to sound sophisticated, maybe. I don't know. It just sounds completely out to Ought me. I? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's so there are variants here, uh, and a lot of these words just work in one versus yeah. the other, and and that's like fine under the lexical copying story. It's like, well, you just learn the usage, whatever the usage is, is what you is what you do with this with with you this word. But um, it doesn't. It's a little bit harder in the movement story. The movement story. Like that's an advantage I think of lexical copying in, in all these different places. There's there's all these usage variants which make the movement story a um, little bit harder to work. So one of the main divisions here is the movement story versus the lesson yeah. copy story that's that right. has to do about the auxiliary words and so on. But you, yeah. if you rewind to the phrase there structured grammar yeah. versus dependency grammar. Those are equivalent in some sense in that for any Dependency grammar, I can generate a dependence, a phrase structure grammar, which generates exactly the same sentences. I just, yeah. I just like the dependency grammar uh, formalism because it makes something really salient, which is the dependent, the, the lengths of dependencies between words, which isn't so obvious in the, in the phrase structure. In the phrase structure, it's just kind of hard to see. It's in there. It's just very, very, it's opaque. Uh, technically, I think phrase structure grammar is mappable to dependency grammar. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah, yeah But there's equivalent. like these like little labels, S and P, V, P. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a particular dependency grammar, you can make a phrase structure grammar, which generates exactly those same sentences and vice versa. But there are many phrase structure grammars which you can't really make a dependency grammar. I mean, it, they, you can do a lot more in a phrase structure grammar, but you, you get m many more of these extra nodes, basically. You, you can have more structure in there. Uh, and, and some people like that, and, and maybe there's value to that. I I, I don't like it. <laughs> well, for you, <laughs> so we, we should yeah. clarify. So, so dependency grammar... It's just uh, well, one word depends on only one other word, and That's you right. form these trees, yes. and that makes it really puts priority on those dependencies, just like as a as a tree that you can then measure the distance of the dependency from one word to the other. They can then map to uh, the cognitive processing of the 
of these sentences, how well, how easy it is to understand and all that kind of stuff. So it just puts the focus on just like the mathematical um, uh, distance of dependence between words. So like, it's just a different focus. Uh, absolutely. J just continue on the thread of Chomsky because it's really interesting because it, mm -hmm. as you're discussing disagreement, to the degree there's disagreement, you're also telling the history of the study of language, which is really awesome. So you mentioned context-free versus regular. Does that distinction come into play for dependency grammars? No, okay. not at all. I mean, the regular regular languages are too simple for human languages. They oh, they are uh, they. It, it's a part of the hierarchy, but human languages are in in the phrase structure world are definite. They they're at least context free maybe a little bit more a little bit harder than that but uh so there's something called context sensitive as well mm -hmm. where you can have like this is the, just the formal language de description in, in in a context free grammar <laughs> you have one <laughs> this is like a bunch of like formal language theory we're doing here but I'm, i love it okay so you have you have a left hand side category and you're expanding to anything on the right is is a uh that's a context free so like the idea is that that category on the left expands in independent of context to those things, whatever they are on the right, yeah. doesn't matter what. And, and a context sensitive says, okay, I, I actually have more than one thing on the left. I can tell you only in this context, you know, I have maybe you have like a left and a right context or just a left context or a right context. I have two or more stuff on the left tells you how to expand that th those things in that way. Okay, so it's context sensitive. A, a regular language is just more constrained. And so it, it doesn't allow anything on the right. It, it allows very, it, it allows, basically it's a one very complicated rule is kind of what a, 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 a regular language is. And so it doesn't have any, um, I was gonna say long distance dependencies. It doesn't allow recursion, for instance. There's no recursion. In, yeah, recursion is where you, you, which is human languages have recursion, they have embedding and you can't, well, eh, it doesn't allow center embedded recursion, which human languages have, which is what- Center embedded eh, recursion, so within a sentence, within yeah, a sentence. Yeah, within a sentence. So here we're gonna get to that. But I, I, you know, the formal language stuff is a little aside. It, Chomsky wasn't proposing it for human languages even. He was just pointing out that human languages are context free. And then he was most, in, for, for human, because that was kind of stuff we did for formal languages. And what he was most interested in was human language. And that's like the the movement is where we 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 where where he sort of set off in on the I would say a, a very interesting, but wrong foot. It was kind of interesting. It's a very I agree. It's kind of a very interesting history. So there's this. Mm -hmm. So he proposed this multiple theories in fifty seven and then sixty five. There they all have this framework though. Was phrase structure plus movement different versions of the of the phrase structure and the movement in the fifty seven. These are the most famous original bits of Chomsky's work. And then in seventy one is when he figured out that those lead to learning problems. That that there's cases where a kid could never figure out which rule. Um, which set of rules was intended, and and so and then he said, well, that means it's innate. It's kind of interesting. He just really thought the movement was just so obviously true mm -hmm. that he couldn't. He, he didn't even entertain giving it up. It's just obvious. That's that's obviously right. And um, it was later where people figured out that there's all these like subtle ways in which things which which look like generalizations aren't generalizations and they you know across the category they're they're word specific and they, and they have and they they kind of work but they don't work across various other words in the category and so it's easier to just think of these things as lexical copies and and I think he was very obsessed <laughs> I don't know I'm just like guessing mm -hmm. that he he just he really wanted this story to be simple in some sense and language is a little more complicated in some sense you know he didn't like words uh, he never talks about words. He likes to talk about combinations of words. And words are, you know, look up a dictionary. There's 50 senses for a common word, right? The word take will have 30 or 40 senses in it. So uh, there'll be many different senses for common words. And he just doesn't think about that. I, I, it's, or he doesn't think that's language. I think he doesn't think that's language. He thinks that words are distinct from combinations of words. I think they're the same. If you look at my brain in the scanner while I'm listening to a language I understand, and you compare, I can localize my language network in a few minutes, in like 15 minutes. And what you do is I listen to a language I know, I listen to, you know, maybe some language I don't know, or I listen to muffled speech, or I, I read sentences, and I read non-words, like I can do anything like this, anything that's sort of really like English and anything that's not very like English. So I've got a, something like it and not, and I got a control. And, and the voxels, which is just, you know, the um, 
3D pixels in my in my brain that are responding most are, are the, is a language area, and and that's this left lateralized um, area in my head. And and wherever I look in that network, mm -hmm. if you look for the combinations versus the words, it's there. It's it, it's, it's everywhere. The it's the same. That's fascinating. It, and, and and so it's like hard to find. There are no areas that we know. I mean, that's. Uh, it's a little overstated right now. At this at this point, the the technology isn't great. It's not bad, but we have the best the best way to figure out what's going on in my brain when I'm listening or reading language is to use fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and that's a very good localization method. So I can figure out where exactly these signals are coming from, pretty you know down to you know millimeters, you know cubic millimeters or smaller. Okay, very small. We can figure those out very well. The problem is the when. Okay, uh, it, it's it's measuring. Um, oxygen, okay? And oxygen takes a little while to get mm -hmm. to those cells. So it takes on the order of seconds. So mm -hmm. I talk fast. I, I probably listen fast and I can probably understand things really fast. So a lot of stuff happens in two seconds. And so to say that we know what's going on, that the words right now in that network, our best guess is that whole network is doing something similar, but maybe different parts of that network are doing different things. And, and, and that's probably the case. We just don't have very good methods to figure that out right at this moment. And so. Since we're kind of talking about the history of the study of language, what other interesting disagreements, and you're both at MIT or were for a long time, mm -hmm. what kind of interesting disagreements there, tension of ideas are there between you and Noam Chomsky? And we should say that Noam was in the linguistics department and you're, uh, I guess for a time we're affiliated there, but primarily a uh, brain and cognitive science department, which is another way of studying language. And you've been talking about fMRI. So like, what, is there something else interesting to bring to the surface about the disagreement between the two of you or other people in the in this Yeah, point? I, I mean, I've been at MIT for 31 years since 1993 and he, Chomsky's been there much longer. <laughs> so I, I met him, I knew him, I, I met when I first got there, I guess, and I and we would interact every now and then. I'd say that, so I'd say our our, our biggest difference is our methods, and so um, I, I, that that's the biggest difference between me and Noam uh, is that I gather data <laughs> from people, I uh, do experiments with people, and I gather corpus data, mm -hmm. whatever whatever corpus data is available, and we do quantitative methods to evaluate any kind of hypothesis we have he just doesn't do that so you know you you know he has never once been associated with any experiment or corpus work ever and so it's all thought experiments it's his own intuitions so i i just don't think that's the way to do things mm -hmm. um that's a that's a you know across the street there across the street from us kind of difference between mm -hmm. Brain and cogsci and linguistics. I mean, not all linguists, some of the linguists, depending on what you do, more speech oriented, they do more quantitative stuff. But in the in the meaning, um, words and well, it's combinations of words, syntax, semantics, they tend not to do experiments and uh, and corpus analyses. So on the That's linguistic the side, pro probably well, the, but the method is a symptom of a bigger approach, which is sort of a psychology philosophy side on. No, I mean, for you, it's more sort of data-driven, sort of almost like mathematical approach. Yeah, I mean, I'm a psychologist, so I would say we're in psychology. You know, I'm, I'm in brain and cognitive sciences is MIT's old psychology department. It was the psychology department up until 1985, and it became the brain and cognitive science department. And so, I, I mean, my training is in psychology. I mean, my training is math and computer science, but I'm a psychologist. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I mean, I don't know what I am. So data-driven <laughs> psychologist. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are. <laughs> I am what I am, but, I, but I, I'm happy <laughs> to be things. called a linguist. I'm happy to be called a computer scientist. I'm happy to be called a psychologist, any of those things. But in the actual... Uh, like how that manifests itself outside of the methodology is like these differences, these subtle differences about the movement story versus the lexical copy story. Yeah, and the, those the are theories, of, right? Those are theories. So the theories, like the theories are, I, but I think the the reason we differ in part is because of how we evaluate the theories. And so I evaluate Got theories it. quantitatively and he, Noam doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Got it.